Okay, the first job is to position the stencil where you're going to get the most pleasing effect. So this stencil is obviously larger than the object I want to use it on. So I'm just moving it around, trying to look at the negative spaces. Um, in other words, I'm looking at the box through the windows of the stencil so that I can project what that design is going to look like. I'm trying to visualize it. Once I've decided what part of the stencil I want to use, then I simply either tape it in place or have a helpful pair of hands to hold it for me. Here's the box as we purchased it. I think it was $3 at the dollar store. And it's plain but lovely. So I'm getting my stencil again and I'm trying to remember where I decided I wanted to place it on the box. And once I have that in place, I'll get my friend Georgina to hold it for me until I get the first thin, tight coat through the stencil. We are going to be using Van Gogh Furniture Makeup Furniture Facelift. This is a very thick plaster. It's designed to hold at least a, a, an eighth of an inch of relief. Once you put it on, it doesn't just flatten out. And I'm going to load my spatula I'm using a dollar store plastic spat. I scoop it out of the container and I load it right on the very edge of my tool. Now I'm holding the tool like a duck. And when I turn my hand over, you can see if I wanted to move my fingers, I could be going quack, quack. It's very important that you hold your tools the right way. I am putting this on at a 45 degree angle. You see the angle uh, at the trowel is or the spatula is to the work. I want to apply it really thin and tight. I'm trying to create a good bond with the substrate. So I'm using a bit of pressure, more pressure than you would use to put face cream on, for example. Um, notice how that little notch is sticking out and it's going to the right. So I'm going to use my spatula in the same direction so I avoid actually bending that little point up. Pay attention to your stencil when you're applying this first thin, tight coat. Now, once you have applied that initial thin, tight coat everywhere, you want to go back and just build up relief. The proper term is ba relief, B-A-S relief. And so now the angle of my spatula to the work is much, much lower. The lower the angle, the more product gets left behind. Um, and as you can see, I have to keep reloading. And I am not using nearly as much pressure as I did when I put the first coat on. All I'm trying to do now is basically ice the cake. You will get some ridges, but don't worry about it because we're going to sand it after it dries. So I scoop up the excess. I reload it right on the edge of the tool. As you apply the product, it naturally gets pushed back towards the ferrule and you want to constantly be reloading it. What I'm describing there is um, that I didn't build up three layers. I built up three swipes, one after the other. When you remove your stencil, hold one end firmly in place while you lift the other to avoid smooshing the work you just did. And now I am gathering up all the excess that went over the edges with my finger and I'm putting them back in the container because they're still nice and wet. You could have taped it. I could have taped it, but why? That's a lot of extra work, and this takes seconds. We are not about perfection here. Allow to dry overnight. I wanted to show you how to properly tape a stencil down when it does fit on your project. So here, Georgina is using this lovely little stencil from Maison de Stencil. I got this library of Edwardian script letters, and they're really lovely. Anyway, this stencil has a border around the edge, so Georgina is taping over that border because she doesn't want to use it. Make sure that you tape over anything you don't want to show on your finished project. A lot of stencils have the stencil maker's name engraved in the lower right or left corner, so make sure you tape anything out like that. Also, you should tape a larger border around the edge in case you pull the product past the edge of the tape. You're going to see why uh, as Georgina finishes this little project. And you see she's got a margin there where there's no tape. She's pointing to an area 
where she actually dragged some of the product over the edge of the tape and then it went directly onto her project. Not a big deal. You can wait till it dries and you can just uh, sand it off or as Georgina's done, just take a damp cloth and wipe it away. Again, perfection is not what we're into here. It really doesn't matter. You won't notice it. When you remove the tape, hold down the corner of the stencil farthest away from where you're pulling and pull the tape at a 45 degree angle. You see how the tape is angled away from the project? That's going to give you the cleanest removal. And I'm just helping her out there because if you allow the tape to pull the stencil up when you're trying to just remove the tape, you could actually smear your work by, you know, smooshing, as I say, the stencil. So now you can see the beautiful results of using the furniture facelift through that lovely stencil. And again, don't worry about that little mushy stuff there. It'll, it'll disappear. You'll see. After your project has dried either overnight or in the case of a really hot and dry day, a few hours, maybe four to six hours might be enough. You want to make sure it's completely dry, not just on the surface, but underneath. If you try to sand this when it's still gooey underneath, then you're going to just swipe off a whole big blob of it as you're trying to sand the surface. Use your fingers to determine where the ridges or sharp bits are and then sand them off until they feel smooth. Do not use a lot of pressure or you'll end up sanding away all the texture you just built up. You want to use light pressure with 220 grit sandpaper. Now product will build up around the openings of the stencil. Those openings are called windows. That is a dead giveaway that this is not carved wood but a stencil. So make sure you get rid of those ridges that build up around the openings. Once you have sanded away all the parts that are undesirable, then you want to remove all of that dust. My favorite way to remove dust is with an old paintbrush. I usually will do this over the garbage can if it's a small enough project, but uh, as you see, Georgina was starting to swish all the dust into our work area, which is not a good idea. Dust is the enemy of paint, as you well know. So make sure that you sweep from all directions to remove the dust from every little angle and nook and cranny where it may collect. And then you're ready to move to the next phase. Now we're back on my project. I've sanded it and now I want to paint it with my first coat of paint. Here I'm using Serenity and you can see I don't wipe off the side of my brush. I dip it in and I twist it back and forth to get rid of the drip. And now I am moving my paintbrush in every direction so that I get all edges of that texture. And I'm working quickly because I want to get the paint on and then I want to stroke it out so that I allow the leveling properties of the fossil paint to do their beautiful job. So no fiddle farting around, get it on. My first coat is dried and now I want to apply my second coat. This color is my designer color called Dreams of Provence. I'm going to apply it in exactly the same way I did the first coat. You'll notice that I leave the most obvious part of the project for last. I've already painted the sides. You always do the top last because if there's any overflow of paint onto the edges, we want it to be on the least visible part, not the most visible part. So as you see, I'm stroking it out. And if I notice, like there, that I've missed a little spot, I just get it right now and then stroke it out. Here I'm looking for drips or missed spots and I see one. So I very gently just tap the paint into that little edge. Paint is dry and now it's time to distress. Remember that we always distress with water. We want to alleviate any dust issues. You don't want to be breathing in any kind of dust. Even baby powder is not good for you. So we always use water. Plus it makes much more natural wear marks. Here I'm using 600 grit wet dry sandpaper and I've just done my initial pass and now I want to see how vigorously I have removed the top layer of fossil paint. So wring out your washcloth and make a smooth pad and wipe away the slurry. I can see now that that isn't nearly enough distressing for my taste so I'm getting my sandpaper wet again and I'm going to distress some more. Now you see the slurry that I'm creating? That's actually Serenity and Dreams of Provence mixed together. So that's why you get that neat sort of gray color. 
and I can't see how much distressing I've done. So once again, I'm going to have to wipe away that slurry to check my progress. Make a smooth pad, wipe away the slurry, and I'm showing you how much you are removing when you distress, both on my hand and the cloth. Don't be afraid. If you take too much off and you don't like it, well, let it dry and paint it again. Not a big deal. You see how I've revealed some of the furniture facelift there? I absolutely love that. It looks like the color of old carved wood, and that's why I have deliberately tinted the product to that color. Now I'm getting a little bit more specific about where I want to remove the fossil paint. So I'm switching to just the wet t-shirt here instead of the 600 grit wet dry sandpaper. You have to start thinking about where this would, would naturally become distressed. I'm right-handed, so if this was my little box, I would lift it up from the front and the right-hand side most often. And over the years, that's where you would see the wear and tear. So I'm going to make sure that I distress a lot on that right hand side. I also really like to get down to the bare wood when I distress a piece. Not always, but most of the time. That way you get a lot of depth and many layers of simulated years of paint and use. So here I'm revealing some of the bare wood and I will show you a close up of how I have revealed the bare wood right there on the corner. Now I am going to distress the sides off camera because it's not very exciting. You've seen that before. But before I do that, I'll just be a little bit pickier about revealing some of those edges. And I like to make interesting shapes with my distressing so that it's not all the same. I don't like to be symmetrical. That looks fake. I want to make sure that I create something that looks organic. Now it may look like I'm actually hitting the top edges of the piece, but really all of the pressure is right on the very side edge. I'm just trying to create some wear right on those side edges. Once I have finished distressing it as much as I like, I'm going to rinse out my cloth again and get it as clean as I possibly can. And then I'm going to wipe down the piece with very little water, removing all of the slurry so that I don't leave any dust or halo of paint behind. You don't want to leave a film of slurry to dry over top of your project because that will not take the wax beautifully the way it should. So wipe everything down nicely and then leave it to dry. I wanted to show you the technique that Georgina is doing on her piece. Dip the stencil brush into the fossil paint, in this case it's Halo, and then offload most of it. By swirling the brush around on the paper towel, you do two things. You remove the excess fossil paint, but you also work the paint up into the bristles a little bit. Now Georgina is testing how much paint is left by rubbing it on her hand. If you have too much paint, then you will be able to see brush strokes through the stencil and that is a dead giveaway for an amateur paint job. Now she's gently swirling the paint through the stencil onto the furniture facelift, which is now under two coats of Mama's Boy. The finish here is sort of an homage to Wedgwood China. You know, that lovely blue china with the white relief. So that's what she's sort of creating here. Now, as you can see, she's swirling the paint on very gently with very little pressure. Sometimes you might have to pounce if the stencil is standing up as it is right there. If she were to swirl right there, the brush would go underneath the stencil and get onto the area where she doesn't want any halo to appear. So in that case only, pounce. Otherwise, I highly recommend always using the swirl technique. It looks more like a hand painted finish. If you pounce by, you know, pushing the brush up and down, then you get little dots of paint and I don't think it looks as good. Once in a while, that may be the technique that you want and the look that you want, but most of the time, swirling is going to be the way you want to go. If you want to do two coats, let the first one dry with the stencil in place and then do your second coat. When the second coat is still wet, remove your stencil. 
Now this is lovely and you could leave it here. It's absolutely beautiful. But Georgina is going to add one more little bling level. So to the bride, liquid metals. Georgina is now using the same technique as she did when she applied the halo, except she's not applying the to the bride everywhere. She's sort of going here and there with lost and found edges, and she's creating a look that's kind of like crushed velvet. It's really, really neat and subtle. So when she removes the stencil, you'll be able to see a little bit of how it looks. It's really hard to photograph this. We will show you a still picture at the end, which hopefully captures this better, but it's absolutely gorgeous. Sorry for the bad cuts. Georgina lifted it out of frame. On my project, I'd like to demonstrate dry brushing. I want the color to appear only where the furniture facelift is, so I replace the stencil. And I'm going to be using our liquid metals paint in the color Honeymoon. The idea is to deposit a scant whisper of color using a barely, barely wetted brush. So I dip our two inch aristocrat brush into the paint. And these brushes are awesome for this technique. And then I want to remove almost all of it. As you see, paint is coming off on my cloth, and I need to continue to move it around so I can see how much paint is coming off, and that lets me know how much paint is left on the brush. There you can see almost nothing coming off. So now I know the brush is ready. Leaving too much paint on the brush is the biggest mistake you can make with this technique. Better to err on the side of not enough paint because you can just repeat the process. But if you have too much paint, it ruins the effect. What I want to do is have just a kiss of shimmer on the top of my box, only where the relief is. So I will apply it like this, and then I'll remove the stencil. If it's not enough, I'll repeat the process. But as you'll see, the amount I've deposited is just perfect. Now I know you can't see anything now, but watch as I lift, and you see the shimmer in the light as it catches. And that is exactly what I wanted. It's absolutely beautiful.